everyone. This is uh, my name is Santiago Siri. I'm a co-founder of Democracy Earth. We're a non-profit organization that um, basically tries to understand what democracy is in the information age. Uh, and we have been doing a bunch of crazy democratic experiments uh, over the last five years. We tried everything from liquid democracy, direct democracy, participatory budgeting, quality voting, you name it. And we work with all kinds of organizations. We work with political parties, we work with uh, uh, parliaments, congresses, non-profit organizations, and also decentralized networks. And here's the thing that I can tell you after five years of doing democratic experiments. Usually when people go out there for a vote, it's because it's a very high risk decision. And the higher the risk, the higher the need for legitimacy. Uh, and when it's a contentious decision, there's also a lot of interest in trying to uh, corrupt or subvert or, or manipulate the decision-making process. So over these five years, we have also been hacked a lot of times. Um, and democracy is one of the most hostile in the environments to deploy systems. So we learned a lot. Uh, and, but today I want to talk about the core of the problem. Uh, it, that is in decentralized networks. We, we, we know very well what happened with centralized networks. With centralized networks, there, there's one company, one Silicon Valley corporation that broke democracy, and that's Facebook. And the reason Facebook broke democracy is simply because they were the best ones at formalizing humans on the web. And that means that Facebook today has a database with 2.7 billion people, larger than the Chinese government, larger than any government on Earth, and now they are even considering doing their own currency. So, when you become the largest repository of identity with people taking selfies, training your face AI algorithms every day, um, you, you, you'll likely end up breaking whatever technology is, uh, precedent technology is democracy is being made with. Now, when we look into blockchain space, um, there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening, but there's one key missing ingredient which the web got in an authoritarian way, which is identity, humans. Where are the humans in the blockchain? We are lacking tools to formalize humans over these uh, networks. So, the problem with this is that it's limiting the social impact of blockchains. Um, Blockchains have been extremely good on the financial part of the spectrum of economic activity, but the, the promise of what blockchains can achieve in terms of uh, transforming our society beyond finance, beyond capital, is not there. Um, if we look quickly at proof of work, which inaugurated our whole space with the Satoshi's paper, the explicit mention of Satoshi uh, in his paper in relation to governance, uh, is one CPU, one vote. And it's basically one CPU, one vote is ruled by the machines, not by the people, ruled by capital, not by society. Um, and this has, uh, you know, this makes sense in the world of finance where privacy is a fundamental right, and this has bent uh, the design of these protocols around uh, finance and around protecting privacy. But at the same time, we're still witnessing how democracy is being disrupted and break, broken all around the world because of digital technology as well. So the potential of decentralized networks, of blockchain-based networks, to use this, this, the, the, the tremendous disruptive capacity of these technologies to improve our democracies or to level up our democracies for the challenges of the 21st century must not be lost. Now, when we look into proof-of-stake systems, something we all know here in this room is that proof-of-stake systems, voting with your money, uh, and whoever has more money wins, is a plutocratic way of governance. And maybe this makes sense for private companies, where you want the largest shareholders with the largest skin in the game to have more influence in the decision-making process. And when it's about public goods, when it's about public infrastructure, not necessarily uh, skin in the game is a good uh, alternative to weight the conflicting interests we find within society. And even if the skin in the game uh, argument was to be put out there, uh, sometimes investors have skin in multiple games. And sometimes you want some games to lose for other games to win. So skin in the game uh, is not compatible when there's conflict of interest. 
An interesting case this year is in the, in the governance of Aragon, on one of the AGPs. Um, there, you know, this is a timeline where on the, on the x-axis you see the different votes of people staking tokens on the AGP, and at the last minute, a whale appeared, and that sing single whale pretty much took control of the entire election. None of the other votes became relevant because the whale simply waited until the last moment to decide how he, she, or he would allocate its tokens and, and bring the election in, in its own interest. So proof of stake can work for certain, uh, certain aspects, but it's, it's, at the end of the day, a plutocratic uh, way of governance. So, here's the question that we're facing, and, and this is, I, I will make a disclaimer right now. I'm more confused than ever about this problem, uh, about trying to figure out proof of human, which is what, we're, what we have identified after five years of doing work at Democracy Earth as the core challenge to sort out in order to understand how we can do democracy over the internet. Is proof of human possible? Well, I'm now more confused than ever, but I'm convinced that if we get this, we will get all of these dApps that are uh, that have tremendous potential. If we sort out proof of human, we will get democracy, universal basic income, portable credit, better alternatives to KYC, fair airdrops, even luxury communism. Who knows? A lot can happen if we can do proof of human. I do know, uh, I've been involved with some organizations, the Partido de la Red in Argentina, which is a party uh, I have had the, uh, the, the incredible experience to, to, to found uh, that eight years ago, the Partido Digital of Uruguay, which is exactly like the Partido de la Red in Buenos Aires, and they are running for the presidential election this year, or Andrew Yang, who is trying to make UBI. This, this is the demand side. These are the folks that will need a technology like Proof of Human in order to deliver on some of their promises and in order to take blockchain-based technology beyond the means of uh, finance and start building technologies that can also bring solutions to society. Um, but here's the, the, the principle that we must abide with. Here, here's a very important uh, consideration that I think it's, it's great that Edward Snowden in, in, during Web3 in Berlin this year, he said this, and, and I think it was you know, definitely the highlight of that uh, extraordinary conference he, he gave in the summer. We don't need to verify the identity, we need to verify the right to use a technology. And this is a very important distinction because if we put our identity on chain in an immutable ledger for there to live on forever, and if things happen and there's a totalitarian regime, then that totalitarian regime can abuse that information in very dangerous ways. So when we are working with identity, we are working with a very sensitive piece of information. Uh, but we need, to, we need to prepare ourselves for the future. We need to design systems that can help us understand in, in, you know, in what context, uh, in, in, in a world where computation will be far more abundant than it is today, which is far more abundant than it was yesterday, how will computation look in that world, and how in that world uh, we can create systems that we are sure that we will not be uh, taken away by AIs and all kinds of machines. Uh, and also, we must avoid recreating all over again Facebook or the Chinese Communist Party, which are the two largest threats to uh, privacy and, and, and our identities in the world right now. Um, when the web began 25 years ago, the web was also this dream of uh, free information, of connecting humanity. Uh, no one envisioned during the 90s, even though there was a lot of people trying to make money, but no one envisioned that something uh, uh, like Facebook would come out, uh, out of the web. And, you know, Facebook started breaking democracies far way before Donald Trump. They started breaking democracies actually during the Obama election. Facebook was critical for the election of Obama. The, the, I guess society was not pissed off because uh, I'll be pleased of, of that because after all it was the Americans using Facebook to elect an American president and when the Russians are using Facebook to elect an American president or any foreign power is using this Trojan horse to elect uh, an authority over another country then the very concept of the nation state starts blurring the very concept of non-domestic intervention in each other's affairs is no longer there so we are in a very new political reality 
and we must prepare ourselves for a world of abundant computation. Now, abundant computation is showing us something that is uh, very scary, uh, and is that the cheaper information gets, the more truth becomes manipulated. Um, and I think that an extraordinary example of this is big things. Uh, big things, all of these pictures, all of these guys that you see here, don't exist. They have been generated by uh, what is called a generative adversarial network, which is, a, is two machine learning algorithms or two neural networks that uh, uh, reinforce each other and learn from each other. And uh, once the network is able to understand the properties of human faces, it can okay. I guess the HEV is in the room. <laughs> They're actually in the room. I don't mind. I don't mind. I can talk loud. We're among friends here. Um, there might be some spies, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the the weird thing about this technique of guns is that usually in technology there's this thing called the uncanny valley, uh, and the uncanny valley uh, in CGI, in computer graphics, the uncanny valley is that moment where you can. It, the thing tries to be so realistic that you see it start seeing the glitches rather than the re realistic attempts of the graphic or the 3D animation that you're looking at. In these pictures, there's no more uncanny valley. It's extremely hard to tell if these pictures have been generated or not by an algorithm. There are some tweaks that you can look very closely that might tell you that this has been generated by an algorithm, but otherwise, we have to prepare for a world where this can be done with any face in video format and also with our voices. And the, the better gangs get, the, the weirder reality gets. Now, this is not necessarily all bad. This, is, this actually can be weaponized uh, to break existing political reality. Uh, an interesting example on deepfakes is um, the Andrew Yang campaign, which is, it has a DAO called the Yang DAO, which I would encourage you to check it out and, and become a member. You have to pay 40 die to, put, uh, to become a member of the Yang DAO. One of the first experiments that came out of that is doing deep fake videos about Andrew Yang. <coughs> and I think this is brilliant because, you know, in a McLuhan, uh, uh, as McLuhan said, the medium is the message, Andrew Yang is this guy talking about universal basic income because artificial intelligence is going to take all our jobs, and we get to communicate this, display exactly what the power of the artificial intelligence is doing uh, with reality itself. So the medium is the message, deep fakes, let's use them to break existing political reality, but let's be aware that this can be used, uh, this is the space, the, the world that we're gonna be living in the next couple of years. Um, another big problem for uh, decentralized identity or ver verifying humans on chain is uh, civils. Uh, civils that uh, might impersonate multiple identities. Usually a technique to prevent this is using reputation algorithms. PageRank, a very well-known reputation algorithm that gave us Google. Uh, but the problem with reputation algorithms is that they are really, in mathematical terms, al uh, algorithms of centrality. They, they, they identify, they start making more nodes, more central than other nodes. So it starts centralizing all over again when, when, when we, what we want to achieve is a decentralized protocol. Uh, then there's... Uh, how we store identities or how we index these identities. If we narrow down identity to a one-dimensional uh, piece of information, whether it's a username or an address or, a, or a, you know, a, any kind of one-dimensional identifier, um, whoever has no knowledge of that uh, 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 the list of uh, addresses um, can become, uh, you know, can start exploiting this information in an Orwellian way. So we, we, maybe we have to also think about how we store the information related to identity or how we refer to identity uh, in, in digital space. So um, because I'm very confused, what I thought I'm going to do here at DevCon is just show you everything that I've been looking around that's happening that's trying to do a proof of human approach. And these are all prototypes or very interesting demos and, 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 and experiments that are trying to take different angles of how we verify humans uh, over decentralized networks. So a very, a very uh, nice experiment is uh, Humanity DAO. 
Humanity DAO is a token curated registry. You stake tokens and you nominate candidates and these get approved or, or disapproved or you can challenge existing candidates by using a simple token economy. Um, Humanity DAO is based on Twitter, so you evaluate the candidates by looking at their Twitter profiles and if their Twitter profile looks like it's a unique human, then you can vote in, in favor of that profile. It has some bugs. I was able to generate five identities with it, simply changing the username of, the, of my uh, Twitter account. Uh, but uh, it is a first step. It is a nice first step where we can start playing, well, how can TCRs help with this or not? Um, and I encourage you to, to, to check out uh, Humanity Down and play, play with it yourself. It's already live on the mainnet. Um, an evolution of this approach, uh, and is, is, this is still under the wraps, I think it's, you know, it's still being worked by the team of Kleros, we at Democracy Art, we are collaborating with them, uh, is to do a web of trust with, uh, using TCR with video proofs. The interesting thing about Kleros is that it introduces um, an element which I think is very important for uh, evaluating these proofs, which is randomness. Uh, if we, you know, if you look at PageRank, in PageRank you will end up having validators that are that gain more reputation than other validators, and as you gain more reputation, that means that maybe in the future you can bribe those highly reputable validators, and those highly reputable validators can corrupt the system. So we need to do a system where random, randomness is an important element, and the jurors or those who are evaluating the proofs. Um, you know, cannot be predicted because they are uh, the consequence of sortition, which is one of the properties of uh, the original Greek democracy, sortition. And uh, Kleros is definitely the one technology in the space that is uh, really playing with, with randomness and electing jurors to evaluate evidence uh, in very interesting ways. And uh, they are, you know, working in the direction of uh, helping figure out how to do proof of human. Um, Another approach, which I think is one of the most approaches in this space, is doing synchronous Turing tests. Uh, this is a project uh, from Russia called IDENA, and what IDENA has identified is Turing tests that are machine learning resistant, or that are very hard for computers to do, but very easy for humans to do. And here is a very simple example. They call these flips, so you have two flips, uh, the same four images on each uh, strip and uh, in one of the images the correct is the right order and uh, the, the order is, the, is, the, is, is correct and in the other image the order is not correct. So you have to decide which one is right. Usually you can do this right now yourselves. Usually humans get this right 95% of the times, so over 90% of the times computers get this right 70% of the times. Why is that? Because we humans, we have the cultural background to understand what might be the narrative or the story of the cat and the flowers and, and what might be going on there. Computers might be able to recognize some of the patterns inside the pictures, but computers don't have the cultural background to understand how these pictures go, go together. So uh, this is a very interesting exercise. Uh, and this has led to the guys of IDENA to be able to actually uh, research, uh, and here's another one if you want to do it, uh, to actually research uh, machine learning resistant tuning tests. Um, and uh, they, they have found out that these types of tests, um, they need to have certain properties to be machine learning resistant. Uh, one is these problems need to belong to the what is considered AI hard problems. AI hard problems are problems that do not consist of pattern recognition. Anything that is based on pattern recognition can eventually be exploited with an algorithm. These are problems that require abstract thought or some kind of insight uh, that you know it's harder for a, a machine to grasp. Also, this means that these problems must not be generated by an algorithm because anything that is generated by an algorithm can be reverse engineered. So these need to be problems that are created by humans uh, and not by algorithms. Um, so what IDENA does, uh, what IDENA does is uh, they put these Turing tests uh, in the network and participants of the network have to solve these Turing tests at the same time. So this is how they prevent civil attacks. They have a party 
where, uh, let's say, actually the next one is in two days, you can go to the IDINA website. Um, thanks, yeah, you're not with the KGB, I guess. Um, or the FBI. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, the FBI is, I won't get into that. Um, you can get me outside. Uh, but the, the, so you get people solving a problem that is easy for humans, hard for machines, at the same time. Because this uh, during test party solving pro solving problem party is happening in simultaneous, in, 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 a, in a synchronous event, um, you might have a genius that is able to solve uh, three or four or five of these super fast, uh, but uh, that's why it's not exactly a proof of human uh, protocol, more of a proof of personhood protocol, you might get some seagulls, but because it's the, the resolution of these problems happens at the same time, uh, it prevents the civil attack problem. Um, assuming that these Turing tests are still hard for machines to, to figure out. Um, I think that we need to look deeper into this type of Turing test, I think that, that there can be more creativity on how we think about this. Uh, but this it definitely is a, is a very interesting approach uh, to, to, to this problem. Another approach which is still uh, theoretical, but I'm going to show later a practical implementation of some of these ideas, is uh, you know, researching your social graph. There's a very good paper by Glenn Weil uh, called, uh, called Verifying Identity as a Social Intersection. Uh, consists on evaluating uh, or your social graph assuming that identity is a consequence of the different social intersections or the different groups we are a part of. Um, and it's interesting because, uh, for example, usually in cities, a lot of people will belong to a lot of groups, so you will have many, many narrow intersections, and uh, in each one of these intersections will describe a part of your identity, whereas in rural areas, usually a lot of people belong to the same group. So you have populated, a few populated intersections, whereas in cities you have many intersections with few people in them. And that's the, the difference between living in a city and living in the countryside. Uh, intersectional identity is a pre-formal way of identity, and the claim of this paper is that we can formalize some aspects of this identity model and start basing identity in, in our, or creating even a new political subject that is not directly linked to the individual, uh, but it's also linked to its communities or its multiple communities, um, which is a, it's a, it's an interesting approach. I would recommend checking out this paper. Uh, there's an implementation of some of these ideas uh, on this protocol called Bright ID. Right ID, you, you, you have a score which begins with zero and uh, you start uh, making handshakes with trusted contacts and if those contacts belong uh, to a group and you 50% and you, of the group you have already established a connection with and you become a member of that group, that will feed your score, your civil rank score um, and you, Bright, Bright ID is, is an implementation of uh, graph analysis uh, and through graph analysis establishes a score that uh, uh, tries to estimate your, your, you know, the likeness of you being a unique human. Um, so they, they have a working version on, uh, that you can download and play with it. Um, then there's, uh, you know, something that we ask ourselves is, you know, can we actually piggyback, piggyback uh, government infrastructure? What, what the, the piece of information you know, provided by governments which have already done a lot of the proof of work to determine you know, that you're a unique human in a way that we don't reveal information about the government. So maybe a technique is you know, showing that you own a government issued ID and you take the typical picture you do in a KYC of your face and, and showing your government issued ID but with a technology that is able to automatically blur from that government ID any bit of personal information. Um, that, uh, you know, the same technology that can automatically blur uh, bits of information in your government ID is the same technology that can actually paste uh, new information into that, into that government ID. Uh, what we want to verify is, you know, not necessarily who you are or what specific information that is personal about you in that ID, what we want to verify is that you hold a government-issued valid ID. 
uh, we don't care about your name or username or, or, or your, your surname or your address or anything like that. We only care that you are a legitimate holder of a government issued ID. Um, but you know, this technology can also be you know, used for other, other purposes. Um, the other is thinking with hardware, not, not uh, only thinking about this with software. Uh, using tracking devices that never ask for uh, any kind of personal information. You know, a technology like this thing that I have here that is constantly tracking uh, my movement around the planet or my movement around the streets and can you know, kind of estimate that I'm actually moving around uh, this world and so makes sure that you know, either I'm, I'm, I'm a living being uh, might be a way of uh, trying to, to, to use that uh, bit of information then to mine some kind of proof of humanity assuming that uh, uh, you know, this, this hardware is untamperable, which uh, you know, is a big assumption. Um, but you know, these are some of the ideas of what's happening with, with proof of human. So looking at all this, looking at everything that's happening, uh, and all of these implementations have trade-offs. Uh, some are easier than others, some are, are cheaper than others, uh, some are more uh, specific. Uh, we figured, well, let's not just focus on one specific approach, let's try to find out how, you know, how we can work with all of these different approaches and, kind with a, and come up with a common denominator or a common score that can help us weight these different uh, ways of valuing identities. So, an idea that has been injected to me uh, by Albert Wenger, actually, is going to the realm of thinking about identity in a probabilistic way. Uh, not thinking about identity either on a, you know, you are a human or not a human, but thinking an identity or humanity as a spectrum, and the chances of the likelihood uh, that you're a human uh, based on different certificates or different scores. So um, the problem of you know basically why identity is very hard is because it's this thing that lives in these two universes. There are, you know one is the subjective universe that consists mostly of our attention, and the other is the objective universe. Uh, and identity is something that lives in between this. So considering the proof of human things that I showed you before, we can see that in the objective side of the spectrum, basically we are doing claims as strings of bits, any string of bits. Uh, we have pictures, fingerprint, video, uh, you know, these, these strings of bits go from lower entropy to high entropy depending <laughs> on how complex they are, and we have different verification mechanisms uh, that rely on computing, some rely more on computing and the others rely more on, 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 on attention um, like APIs, timestamps, intersections, machine learning, Turing tests and TCRs. Um, so can we weight all this in a, in a score that can help us make sense out of this? Uh, something that, you know, given any Ethereum address, uh, I have some kind of heuristic that will tell me, okay, this, is, this address is likely to be 92% human and then people can write smart contracts using that input uh, in order to evaluate a credit or, or evaluate any kind of uh, human-based service. Uh, but the thing that we need to ask is, if we are doing an algorithm like this, is who watches the watchman? Who is determining how this algorithm works? So this algorithm must not be simply a, a blind machine, uh, must be something that can take into consideration uh, uh, you know, the, how we want to be observed how we, we want to decide how we want to be observed, how we, you know, our identity is the source of something that comes from a process that is uh, legitimate. Um, so, to understand legitimacy, a, a technique that, you know, it's interesting that we have been researching a lot at Democracy Earth is quadratic voting. And uh, how many of here are familiar with quadratic voting? Okay, I would encourage you to uh, read about it. Quadratic voting basically you can vote directly on any issue by allocating votes, but the more votes you put on the same issue, the cost of that increases not linearly, but quadratically. So if you put two votes on something, it will cost you four tokens. If you put three votes, it will cost you uh, nine tokens. And this means that with quadratic voting, you are not only measuring the preferences of the voters, you are also measuring the intensity of those preferences. And a consequence of quadratic voting is that 
it tends to uh, generate uh, normal distributions uh, of uh, preferences. Uh, in tests we have done using Likert scales, uh, Likert scale ballots, this typical surface where you have strongly disagree, strongly agree, and values in between. When it's without quadratic voting, people tend to go to the extremes, to strongly disagree, strongly agree. Uh, but when it's with quadratic voting, we have these Gaussian uh, bells, these, these normal distributions, and people tend to go closer to the center. So there's less polarization, and the data is, uh, has a much better organic distribution, which helps to, uh, which is better data actually for algorithms, uh, for machine learning algorithms. We have done uh, an implementation in quadratic voting, the first implementation in the US for the state of Colorado in the United States, and uh, we got exactly that. We got an organic distribution of, uh, we had 41 state legislators to decide over 107 bills, and we had an organic distribution of, the, of how to rank these bills throughout time. So uh, when we compare this with participatory budgeting, with participatory budgeting, which is a linear distribution of tokens or votes, with participatory budgeting, legislators found that 50, 60 percent of the bills had the same amount of tokens, so they were not able to prioritize among the long tail of bills. With quadratic voting, we were able to prioritize a, long, a very long tail of bills. So we're working on bringing some of these ideas together. We're building a democracy DAO. Uh, you know, I'm a member of Molok DAO, so I'm going to put my shares of Molok DAO subject to these democracy DAO experiments. And um, we, uh, you know, there's more to this like zero knowledge proofs and uh, ERC 725 identity standard. Come look for me on Twitter, I'm at SantiCity on Twitter. And there's a proof of humanity meetup if you want to come, it's tomorrow at 6 p.m. Take a picture of that and, and we'll, we'll talk more about this. Thank you very much.